Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone around the world. My name is Teresa Moulton. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of the Change Management Review, and I'm excited to be here today with you to discuss how senior executives know if your change management function is working. Uh, just to set the stage a little bit, um, what we're not going to cover is uh, how to close gaps. So um, what we are going to cover is how to identify the gaps. So what we want to do here is talk about how we get senior executives' attention and how do we look at our function um, to find out what needs to be in place for it to actually work. Um, we got a lot of good questions uh, coming in before the presentation in the registration process. And the good news is that we are going to cover most of the questions that came in. So I'm excited about that. Okay, so our objectives for today are to qualify the executive need for change management, to define components of a change management function, and to understand the symptoms of change management functional effectiveness. Uh, so when we when we look at change management functions, I think it's really interesting that even back in 2017, ProSci measured that 40% of all organizations across industries have a CMO or functional group for change management. So we're talking about something that's actively happening um, in, in our world right now in terms of the profession moving forward and change management functions um, and centers of excellence being set up. So our first, our first um, question is, how do we actually get the attention of a senior leader? And so we asked the question, do senior leaders care about change management? Um, and it's interesting to note that even today, some leaders may not have heard of the change, heard, heard of change management. Some have heard about it and don't know what it really means, and others see it as that tactical HR thing that gets down in the organization. So part of our challenge is to determine, do we actually have the audience of the senior leaders in order to have this conversation? And one of the ways that we can determine that is to determine whether the change is tactical or strategic. And what we're going to find is that anything that is not coming up as strategic is probably not going to hit the, um, it's, it's probably not going to hit the baseline for uh, senior leader attention. Okay, I just got a question. Will a copy of the slides be out there? Yes, we will do a copy of the slides. Sorry. Um, so we're going to be talking about strategic and tactical, and we need to ask the question, do, do senior executives see change management as a resource to the senior team? Is the function fully staff structured and functioning? So when the senior team has major initiatives uh, that are coming down the pike, do they call on the change management function um, or do they find a different way to get that transformational change in? And that's a real sign of whether or not they know you exist. And if you're in a change management function that doesn't have the the vision of this the visibility to the senior team then that can be that could be a challenge so let's look at what would make a change management what would make change management a strategic level inquiry on the left we have some the categories about what would give a lower level of senior leader interest versus on the right, we're looking at what needs to be in place to get a higher level of senior leader interest. And, you know, we talk about on the left, tactical change or incremental change, um, change that's happening lower down in the organization, uh, ideas that are good ideas, uh, but maybe not business imperatives. And you know, looking at installations of change, not necessarily realized business outcomes. And on the right-hand side, we're looking at strategic transformational types of change. Um, we're talking about change that's ha happening at higher up in the organization. It is business imperative that these changes get done, and we're realizing business outcomes. So the good news is that if you're in the right-hand side of um, 
the chart, you're probably going to get senior level attention. But if you're doing more incremental and tactical types of changes, there's a good chance that they're not going to be paying attention to it. They'll expect uh, the direct report of the CEO who's running the the change function or the change project to actually handle it from there. So one way to really qualify this is to ask the questions, are you in a tripod scenario? And this is adapted from Daryl Connor. And basically what we're looking at is, um, are we looking at installation or realization? Are we looking at a good idea or a business imperative? Are we looking at something that's transformational or incremental? And you can see the pieces that are actually bolded. Those are the three um, factors that need to be in place to get senior leader attention. So what are the components of a change management function? Um, not rocket science, but I think when you look at it from how is it working, it really does um, it really does give us a way to look at these five items a little bit differently. So strategy, you know, we're looking at what role does the organization expect the function to play? And so one of the things that we look at there is um, basically what are the expected outcomes and uh, you know what, uh, level of practitioner are we going to are we going to be using and then in people we're looking at how skilled the practitioners are the organization we're going to go through each one of these in detail the organization how the change function is organized and how does it support the the strategy so are you a hybrid organization are you a centralized or decentralized organization Positioning, so what's the internal brand? How does the organization perceive the change function? And process and methodology, do you operate in a way that maximizes your ability to deliver on the strategy? And are you doing it comprehensively across the organization? So let's take a look at some of the specifics around these items. So strategy. Um, it's it's definitely the why, the how, and the what results. And when when it's in when it's working and in place, there's usually a charter that spells those things out. So, for example, um, what are the types of initiatives that you're going to be working on? Are they going to be strategic initiatives? Are they going to be incremental initiatives? And how are you going to actually deliver those initiatives? Are you going to have a uh, a workforce in your function that's 40% contractors and 60% full-time employees? Are you going to uh, split up your workforce to have 50% uh, advanced practitioners, 50% um, entry-level practitioners? And basically, why are you actually doing this? So what is this function um, in place for? Why does the company feel like it's got it's got value and that comes back to the types of changes that that it handles so some of our clients will um oh and i should mention uh, so daryl connor and i are launching a company called connor evaluation next year and what we wanted to do was share some of the thought leadership that we've been working on for the past two years so that's where this is coming from so if i say her clients that's that's what I mean by that um, so in terms of our clients they will write a charter that will say you know we're gonna work on 60% uh, of strategic initiatives 30% of routine projects or medium-sized projects and 10% of incremental change in an agile environment that's a lot different because agile itself is a major change in terms of the culture and so forth but the actual work and how it gets done is incremental so that's kind of an exception to the rule when we look at um the symptoms that it is working we're saying okay what how do we know the strategy of the change management function is working well we can see an increased uh competitive advantage in the market um, so the change management function may help projects go in easier or build core capabilities that allow the organization to um, offer better products and services. Uh, a 
compared to their competitors. You've probably heard about increased ROI on the major change initiatives. Um, well, we know that uh, from ProSize work that 76% of change initiatives um, are more effective with change management. So that's, a, that's an interesting point there. Uh, we know that the organization understands the value of the change management function. One thing that uh, I've counseled some of my clients on is the fact that when you're building a change function or you're looking at what's working and not working in a change function, you need to look at how it was rolled out. So was there an actual change management plan that supported the launch and the rollout of the change management function. And that contributes to strategy because we really want to make sure that there's a brand, and we'll talk more about that, about around the function itself. So I think, again, we're getting back to um, demand for the organization services and seen as a critical resource for the senior team. Now, we just had the Lead Change 2019 conference in Boston, Mass earlier in November, and there was um, an example of a change management function that last year we talked about um, offline and they told me that they were in chaos and um, you know they couldn't get senior level attention and then this year they seem to have the senior level attention and they were able to actually they're being called to the table um, and that had to do with how they actually positioned the function and then they got a sponsor internally and worked that upward so I thought that was pretty remarkable when you talk about people this is another part of the work that Daryl and I um, have done, is we created a pra change practitioner competency model. So having a competency model in place for your practitioners is really important because one step that the industry hasn't taken really for change management practitioners is the step to have a development plan in place. So if we look at the people stuff for a change management function, we're looking at what needs to be in place in order to really address all the people concerns. Are there role profiles for each level of change management practitioner? Some organizations are you know, just now getting job descriptions in place, and those are different than role profiles, as you know. Are the human resources piece in place? Do you have a functional owner that's at the right level in the organization? Do you have delivery resources and sponsors? What's the development approach that you're providing for your practitioners? And this is interesting too, because um, what we've been what we've been looking at in um, a lot of the a lot of the organizations that we're working with is that the development of change management practitioners is really more of an apprenticeship. Um, so it's really important. The mentoring and the coaching is a really important part of the people strategy for a change function. Um, you get your certifications, you've had some experience on projects, but if you want to grow those management consulting skills, then we're really looking at um, more than training. We're looking at um, mentoring and coaching. And how, what are some of the symptoms that it's working? Well, we know that people in the organization of change management, they know their roles. So they know whether they're being used to work with sponsors or they know whether they're being used to um, actually manage more tactical work to get that done. I think some of the challenges for people um, who are change practitioners working in organizations is they get assigned to a project and they may not have the skill set to complete that project. And all of a sudden you have sponsorship issues or you're not getting the adoption that you need because that person may not have the ability to cascade sponsorship through the organization. So knowing your role and knowing what level of competency you are uh, at is really important. When you look at um, the organization having a realization mindset, that's again, coming back to the strategic level and saying, do we look at business outcomes like competitive advantage or do we actually look at did we make our project dates? Did the system go in on time? Um, you know, and it's more initiative focused for installation. And what we're talking about is realization. So have we really have we improved um, have we improved our cost savings? 
uh, as a result overall in the organization in terms of order fulfillment or whatever the process may be. And I think that um, you also need to look at the influence of the practitioners is building as the projects go on and as you're working with the organization. So now they become the go-to people that um, people ask for in order to get change management work done. When we look at an organization, we look at what needs to be in place. And I had mentioned this more um, a little bit earlier. Uh, so there's centralized change management functions, decentralized change management functions, and hybrid change management functions. And we just had a client where they were a hybrid change management function. So they had a couple of people in HR owning the methodology and the training um, of the of the certified change management practitioners, but the change management practitioners were owned in the in the function or in the region themselves. And what made it a hybrid was that there really wasn't um, the pro the processes really weren't in place to say that it was a fully decentralized function. Uh, people, people basically took a methodology and they implemented it the way that they wanted to, applying it, you know, integrating it with Six Sigma and integrating it with the Bridges model or whatever that was. So there wasn't a consistent rollout across the organization. In a more centralized um, change management function, you usually get more of that consistent methodology and approach that rolls out. So when we see, you know, symptoms that um, the organization uh, is working, we see that, you know, there's a clear set of criteria for saying what to, type of project to say yes to or say no to. And so the, the change function is really starting to manage the expectations of the company and what kind of projects get selected. Um, I think you're talking about uh, strong relationships uh, within the organization. So basically you're, you almost have your internal champions that are, on, are internal clients and the function itself is organized well enough so that it, so that the head of the function or some of the senior folks can go out and build relationships with uh, internal organizations and those relationships can be relied upon uh, later on when projects go live. So I think that um, from an organization standpoint, the other thing that's important is that we have the change management function aligned pretty well with what the overall organizational structure is of the company itself. Um, that allows the that allows the change function to really um, serve the internal customer. So when we talk about positioning, we're talking about a couple of things. We're talking about um, high levels of and consistent levels of executive support. So what does that mean? Well, what it means is that if a change function is strategic and it's seen that way by a senior leader, then it's going to be um, brought up into the organization. So it won't be run out of a lower level position in HR. Instead, it'll report to the office of the CEO or one of the CEO's direct reports. There won't be, you know, multiple layers between the change management uh, function and um, the executive influence and authority. And I think that's a really important piece to um, make sure that is addressed in terms of the charter and the strategy for the function itself. And those are some of the things that in terms of closing gaps, those are the type of things that, you know, you really need an approach to go and elevate the change management function in order to get it to operate at that high level where it's called on by senior leaders. So marketing strategy, when we talk about positioning, we, we're talking about, um, basically what is the internal brand of the change management function? Is it seen as not effective because it's in a function that doesn't have a strong reputation? Is it seen as something that everybody really wants and there's a high demand for it? Um, and what is the communication approach for the change management function? How are they, 
how are you really keeping people apprised of the successes that you have and some of the lessons learned that you have so that people can get accustomed to how change management operates with projects and within the company? Um, when we know that it's working, we're really uh, seeing, as I mentioned, the change management function as a strategic resource. And I think that the, the function's value pr uh, proposition is really clear. So people know that when they get a change management professional from your internal change function, they know what they're gonna do on the project and they know what they can expect in terms of results. And I think when you're also looking at um, change management and how it's called on and what it's doing, it's operating more at the strategic level and it's working on business imperatives. It's, um, it's, it's known by the organization. And I think that's the most important piece. Now, there's a lot on the slide, but in terms of process for the change management function, what needs to be in place are things like, we obviously there's a methodology that's in place. Um, and then you need to make sure that there's a process for making sure that methodology is applied consistently. The change management network has to have a development process in place. Um, a lot of the clients that I see uh, have change management networks, but they're groups of people that they pull together maybe once a quarter or once every other month. And they, the people don't know whether they're a communication partner or whether they're actual change agents. And that's a big uh, role clarification that needs to be made. Um, but the change management network development is important because you really have to always service the change management network and have a development plan for how they come up to speed with more um, skill and more awareness and understanding of their role and how it will function in the organization. When you look at a service delivery model, that's a process about how does the change function engage with its internal clients. So do internal clients have to go through a portfolio of initiatives and then there's a list of initiatives that are approved and then those initiative leaders come to the change function or is the change function at the seat of the table when initiatives are actually rated um, so that the change impacts are included in the risk profiles of which initiatives are selected. Um, I think the other thing that we're finding is not in place uh, from a process perspective is that the change functions don't have capacity management and risk management processes in place. So there's no uh, way of determining change saturation uh, across the company from various projects. And the risk management processes aren't typically integrated with the PMO. And I think those are some important um, things that need to be done in order to make sure that the process of the change function is operating successfully. I got a lot of questions on metrics. So if you're interested in talking about metrics, send me an email and we'll pull together something and have a call or do a webinar on metrics themselves. So change function metrics. Um, one thing that I think is is prevalent right now in a lot of the organizations that I see is that people are getting certified in a methodology that's just a, a three-day class or something that gives people the tools so they can go out and integrate change management into project work, which is really important. Um, but in terms of actually practicing change management, there may not be enough experience to understand the application of some of the broader transformational concepts. So the way that um, the way that this is happening for some folks is they're getting a bunch of people certified, but then when they put them out on the projects, they're not able to get the work done. Um, and there isn't really a plan for how those people get developed to learn how to get that work done. So, you know, if it's working, then we really have a standard methodology and framework that's understood across the organization. When we talk about, um, again, with the change management network, one of the clients that I had had some uh, questions about 
you know, on certain projects, the change management network was operating as a communication partner and they were clear about that. And on other projects, the change management network was working as change agents. So if you're going to do that, you need to be really clear with people about, you know, what their role is as, as part of a change um, management network participant so that they can be su successful in the, in the job. Um, we had one client where they got everybody certified um, in a methodology and then um, they got their, with the certification, um, they put everybody back into the business. And when we went and interviewed and talked to some of these CMPs, people didn't realize that by taking the training, the company was actually going to expect them to, produce, to perform change management consulting work. So that, back to that hybrid example, that's part of the issue is that their deployment of CMPs in the organization was as a result of getting a certification through a training class, but people didn't know why they were selected for the class. They didn't know that they were gonna be expected to do work. Um, there wasn't really an agreement that they were gonna take on this role and, you know, 20% of their job was going to be delivering change management work in their organization. So these are the types of, you know, fuzzy um, boundaries that need to be really laid out and clarified in order for it to work. And I think the um, other thing that's really important is that stakeholders trust the change management function's ability to deliver consistently. So one thing as an external consultant that I always keep in mind is that um, when you get engaged on a project uh, with a client, that client is putting their career success in your, in your hands. So if you're not going to be able to deliver and make that client look good and be successful, then you're really not going to help them build their professional reputation. And that's the same internally. So I know internally you might get a change resource assigned to your project and you may say, well, this person, you know, isn't really good or this person really is good. I think it's important to really make sure that um, if you have a concern with someone's capability that you go back to the head of the function, talk about it and see if instead they can put a team on it or mentoring or something like that. Because the resource capability has to match the work that's being delivered. And if it's a very complex uh, work assignment, you don't want to put someone with, you know, three years experience on a transformational effort um, where they're expected to interact with senior leaders, manage those relationships, and then in addition, partner with the PMO and get, get the change work done. That's a lot to ask of somebody. So when we talk about, um, when we talk about uh, a scorecard, we're saying, you know, let's look at bringing these five areas together. Um, so an example would be, and this is just a, a summary scorecard, um, is that if I was sitting down with a senior leader and I wanted to get them to pay attention to the change management function, and I wanted to start to reposition them um, as part of this work, then what I would I would do is I would pull a scorecard together, I'd put the different um, examples of symptoms in here, and then what I would do is uh, rate those and have a conversation with the senior leader. And so you can see that with strategy, if there's no, no charter in place, then there's a low rating. Um, and so talking to a senior leader about no charter in place gives you a lever to have the conversation on, listen, you're investing ch in change management resources, and because we don't have a charter in place, we don't have an agreement between you and your team as senior leaders and what we're going to deliver. So there's no way for you to know what your ROI on the change management resources it, uh, is, and um, you're not leveraging your investment. And so it also sets us up as a change function that where we can't be successful because we haven't agreed on the target or the aim together. And I think that's really important and is very common in some organizations. You know, ex executives will buy the, the concept to launch a change organization. It will be 
put up and st stood up, but then coming back to really uh, agree on the purpose of that change function and how it will operate in the company is not usually done. And that's where this positioning of the change function gets a little bit out of alignment. Um, when we we're talking about, you know, the people, um, you might have enough practitioners, but not at the right skill level. So you don't have the right resource mix. And um, so you might say that's a medium because we have enough people and we might be able to develop them in an efficient way to get them at the right skill level. But if they're not at the right skill level, what are you going to do? How's that actually going to um how's that actually going to change so that you can close that gap and um, have the conversation with the senior leader about, you know, investing in more development for the function. When we talk about process, um, again, I mentioned before, no capacity management or risk management, so that would be rated a low. And when, when we look at, again, uh, capacity management or risk management, we're talking about no way to get a view into change saturation for the organization with, with the whole project portfolio. And we're also looking at the fact that our risk management may not be integrated into the overall risk management of the organization. So um, actually aligning it with the PMO is usually a good idea unless you're going to be able to have your own scorecard for or risk mitigation and you can use that to manage expectations. The organization itself, when we were talking about that, you know, we're talking about structure and making sure that it's aligned, the change management function um, is aligned with the organizational structure. So that's not rocket science, but if you have a decentralized uh, company, then you, you wanna think about what model you're gonna put in place. Are you going to put someone out into the business or are you going to have relationship managers that manage the business and then you pull the resources internally and deploy them on initiatives? You know, how's that really gonna work? And right now, as the change management profession is, um, really starting to explode, um, there's a high demand for certified uh, practitioners and there's actually not as much, um, there's a lot of work and there's not enough people. So what I'm finding is that individuals who are practicing change management are taking, are assigned multiple big projects and um, it's hard to actually uh, execute on those. And so when we talk about the organization um, taking on work in a decentralized way, I think it's really important that the change function understands what the resource needs are for the initiatives in the different um, parts of the organization and that that expectation is managed up front. So there isn't an expectation that because you just have a single resource out into the business that that person's gonna be able to handle all of the change management work that that function might have or that that uh, region might have. And then we talk about positioning. And again, um, to be the most successful, you wanna be strategic and report to the office of the CEO or to one of the CEO's direct reports. And um, one recommendation that we made to a client was that they move their organi change organization from the manager level up to the VP level. Um, and in this case, the VP is reported to the CEO. And I think that that really helps set the function up for success. So in terms of um, doing this work, it comes down to how is your change management function working? So is it actually being um, looked at? Are you able to look at it and uh, start to pre-diagnose areas that are missing or areas that aren't operating correctly? And then it comes back to what do you do about that? So I'm about um, done with the presentation part right now. So let me, let me take some questions that you, that you have here. So uh, I already mentioned, will we get a copy of the slides? Yes. Um, how do you know if the ROI is attributed to other 
work like project management or lean processes? Well, I think, I think what you have to do is make sure you're clear on the activity drivers of the change management work so that you're measuring the change management work and the impact it's having on the initiative or the project. Um, a, let's see, a session on metrics would be great. On the scorecard slide, what is low? I think low, medium, high need a heading over them. Yes, I think, I think we could be more specific um, on the low, medium, and high, but as an illustration, we're talking about uh, low capability. So low capability in uh, structure or low capability in positioning or strategy. And, so, and then, it, then we start to think about how do we actually address those, how do we actually address those gaps? Okay, just a small contribution. Sometimes change management reporting to a CEO could be a disadvantage. Yes, it could be a disadvantage. Um, I think it. Um, I think it depends on uh, how the CEO is managed in the relationship and what their expectation is of the charter of the function. Um, so the other place that change management can report into is the strategic realization office, which is like the strategy group, and that's also very helpful. So here's one, how can we get change management toolkit something of that sort, which will be essential for us to use it? When can we get a copy of it? Um, prob not in this particular presentation, we're not going uh, through the toolkit, but you can uh, go to the Association of Change Management Practitioners, acmp.org, and they have the standard, the ACMP standard, which offers an approach for implementing change. Okay, any other questions that you have? I'll give you a few minutes to write them in. Okay, so one of the questions that came in here is um, what signs indicate the level of change management maturity of an organization? And um, I think that that's an important point because you know the way that we work with uh, change management maturity, there are five different levels of change management maturity. And the, diff the five different areas that we talked about in this presentation have different uh, have different levels of the capability uh, for each level of change management maturity. Um, and so that helps you assess where are you now as a function, where are you now as uh, in terms of the level of change maturity, and where do you want to be based on the charter and the organization. Um, so we have another another question. How does the PMO overlap interact with change management? That's a really good question. Um, if you know, I always come back to the concept of total implementation resources. So if you have the big pie, you need the resources of the PMO, and you need the um, the resources. And I use that word resource, meaning process people technology, tools, so it's not just human resources, but you need the change management capability and the PMO capability working in in, in alignment with each other. Um, and so one of the ways that people have started to align with the PMO uh, from a change perspective is they have uh, gotten their metrics aligned on one scorecard so that's a big win. If you can work with the PMO and get some of your change management metrics actually um, on that scorecard that gets shown to the senior leadership team, things like capacity, um, you know, what's the saturation level, what's the adopt average adoption level, what's the average ROI on change management work, um, that kind of stuff. Uh, then you can get some visibility immediately at the senior team level because usually the PMO has that kind of access. Um, we have another question that says, um, 
can the PMO and the change management group be one function? Yes, it can be one function. Um, it definitely can be one function. And in fact, there's a trend where change management practitioners and project managers are actually um, getting similar skill sets. They may not have an interest in the same aspect of the work, but project managers are getting more skilled in change management and change management practitioners are getting more skilled in project management. So uh, at that point, you could have you know, uh, a team of well-rounded people in both areas to take on an initiative. We have another question around how can we engage the senior leaders for their, um, I'm not sure what the word is, or it's or as uh, practice their sponsor role. So how can we engage the senior leaders um, for them to practice their sponsor role? And I think one, you know, that example that I gave at the beginning where at the lead change conference, there was um, an organization that was in chaos and the senior team didn't pay attention to them and um, they couldn't get their uh, initiatives lined up and they didn't have the visibility, but then this year, they did, and um, one of the things that they did was they started tying the value proposition of the change management function to the goals of the company. So what happens is you have to actually make that case for action, that business case for change for your change management function and show how that helps the organization realize business results. And once you can get that storyline put in place, then you need to get an internal sponsor to help you get that, put that up there. Um, I have another question. How can we measure if the people uh, incorporated change management comp competency? How can we measure if the people incorporated change management competency? So I think what we're talking about um, is, Change management competency, the model that Daryl and I built has 27 competencies in it. And they ha they range from the basic, um, the basic change toolkit stuff to management consulting um, competencies, like how do you shift the perspective of a senior leader? How, how well are you, how good at you are at sponsorship, building a cascading sponsorship down through the organization? So I think that without, a model to base it on, it's hard to know um, how competent people are. And then we have another one. What's your opinion about conflict of interest among change management and PMO and change management and internal communication? <laughs> well, I don't want to be, I don't want this totally repeated, but internal communication groups can be very difficult to work with um, from a change management perspective because they're the gatekeepers to all the communication that hits the employees and um, when you're running projects as you know you need to get your own communication out there so how those two um, how those two mesh together is really critical and I would suggest having that conversation up front so that you're clear on which um, channels and venues can be used for what types of things. And if it's a smaller project, it's less of an issue, but for enterprise-wide projects, it can be a real, a real challenge. Um, conflict of interest uh, between change management and PMO, I think that um, there shouldn't be a conflict of interest between the two because both of them come together to work on projects in an effective way. So it's more about how do we set up our, you know, how do we set up and define our uh, working relationship up front for the different initiatives that come down the pike. Okay, well, we've, we're going to finish a little bit early, but thank you very much for your time. I hope that this was helpful to you in terms of um, looking at how to start to diagnose um, you know, your change management functions capability. And if you, um, let's see, I do wanna let you know, you can reach me at Teresa at changemanagementreview.com. And then also Change Management Review has upcoming events happening um, next year. 
So we're gonna do another one day lead change conference in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, we're gonna have a change leadership masterclass in Boston, June 22nd and 23rd. And um, it'll be instructed by Daryl Connor, Linda Ackerman Anderson, Melanie Franklin from the UK and Rune Todumbai from Norway. Uh, Rune is the editor of the Journal of Organizational Change and Melanie uh, is a specialist in agile change management. And then we're looking at um, the potential of having an agile change management masterclass um, in October and then the lead change 2020 in Boston. Um, so, okay, that is what we have for today. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to email me and I appreciate your time and hope this was useful for you. Okay, take care.